All right, if you haven't done so already, please let me know in the comments that you are here for the day. Good morning. Oh, excuse me. Okay, let's get started. So, we, um, yesterday we talked about the prokaryotes. Um, oh, okay. Mostly single celled organisms. Or I shouldn't say mostly, all single celled organisms, all prokaryotes are single celled. Uh, and we also got into their, I don't want to call them brothers because they're, or sisters, they're not really related, but viruses, I don't know what you would call them. The, the other, <laughs> the other group that is pseudo alive. Um, today we're going to talk about the other kingdom that I think is relatively unknown and that is the protists uh, and, and and we'll also get into fungi this morning in the first block oh, it's gonna load there it goes so um, protists are a weird one I mean they're they're sort of they're sort of defined as the weird one because uh, in in the textbook and in, in lots of places, they're described as organisms that are eukaryotes. Oh, bunch of reverb. No, it isn't. Let me see if I can fix that. Did, did that fix it, Andrea? Okay. Oh, if it's if it's still like really bad, let me know. I can um, <clears throat> I can uh, do some uh, finagling around here and and fix things up more. Um, where what was I talking about here? Right. How are they described? So, um, protists are often described as the kingdom that of eukaryotes. So they have membrane-bound organelles. That is not a fungus, not a plant and not an animal. In other words, if it isn't any of the other things, it's a protist. <laughs> Which seems like a weird way to describe it taxonomically, but that's that is actually what they do. So that, that, that it's like the group of the rest of the things that isn't plant, animal or fungus. Uh, and and you'll see as as we talk about the different types of protists that exist, they they're extremely extremely diverse. So that that's probably the most um important thing to know about them is that they're a weird group of misfits uh, of life. Some of them are unicellular. Uh, actually, the majority of them are unicellular. Uh, and we'll talk about a d bunch of different kinds of unicellular protists that are single-celled organisms. There are a few that are multicellular. Um, anything that you see growing entirely underwater, okay, so it has no above-water component, um, those are actually, and they look like plants that are growing underwater. Those are almost certainly protists. Uh, now, I'm not talking about corals. Those are actually weird uh, hybrids of multiple different types of organisms. Uh, but I mean, like things like seaweed. Okay, you see it like growing underneath the water. It looks like a plant, uh, but it's actually not a plant. Um, plants are land organisms or at the very least, they have some type of above water component, um, like water lilies and things like that. They, they do have an above water component um, that is required for their life cycle. So there's no, there's no like entirely below water plants. Those, those things that you like buy um, to like go in your um, fish tank or whatever, those are mostly protists. I mean, you can buy ones that are also plants that grow above the water as well, but the ones that are entirely below water are protists. So, uh, I, I think that's fascinating. So, I used to think I used to think those were plants. Those, but those those are the primarily the multicellular protists. There are some multicellular ones that don't look like plants, but m most of them do. Um, so, pretty much, if you can't classify it into one of the other kingdoms of eukaryotes, uh, it's a protist. 
they have a whole bunch of different ways of moving around. We're going to look at some examples. Uh, some of them have flagella, some of them have cilia, which are like little hairs that help them move around. Some of them have something called a pseudopod, which is basically a leg that they can push out from their cell membrane uh, and then pump their body into the leg <laughs> so that they will move the their entire body from where they were to the position of the leg, um, which is a crazy method of locomotion, but that, that exists. Um, anyway, there's all kinds of variety out there. Uh, they have a ton of different nutrient acquisition strategies. So you, you can't define them by that. Some are um, some are heterotrophs, they eat stuff. Some of them are autotrophs, they do photosynthesis. Some of them do both. So they're photosynthetic and they can eat things. Um, so crazy, lots of variety. Um, they have a ton of different methods of reproduction. So some of them are sexually reproducing. Um, so that they they require some type of mating, um, some some types of, some types of sexual reproduction in protists are so weird uh, that you would you wouldn't recognize it as sexual reproduction immediately. Like for example, there are types of protists that are essentially strings of multicellular organisms. Okay, so this is a single multicellular organism, and then you get another string. That is another multicellular organism. And then they bind together. So you'll get these two strings binding together. They will exchange DNA between them. Uh, so that they will each have a mixture of the two's DNA. And then each of these will split and uh, into two. <laughs> I, I think if you saw that happening in nature, you probably wouldn't say, oh, yeah, right, sexual reproduction. <laughs> That's like a totally different thing. So, but it is, I mean, it is sexual reproduction. It's, it's a, uh, a mixing of the, of the gametes, of the uh, genetic information of two adults of a species to produce a, a, a new variable mix in their offspring. So it, it is technically sexual reproduction, but it's, it's like a wacky version of that. Uh, lots of other ones, lots of other different types of protists have strategies where, um, let's say that it's like a single-celled protist, it'll grow, um, or let's say it's multi-celled, okay, let's say it looks like this, it will actually grow a brand new version of this attached to it. So it'll slowly grow a new version off of it and then that version will detach this is a multicellular organism um, and th that that's called budding it's basically when you grow a baby on you of but it's a clone it's a clonal reproduction uh, and then then now there's two of them but it's multicellular that's weird. <laughs> so anyway, there's all kinds of stuff. There's all kinds of stuff in protists, um, which is again why, why they're this sort of like weird group. I mentioned um, way way back at the beginning of this idea that uh, taxonomy is sort of flexible. It it's like always changing and getting updated based on genetic evidence. And protists are a great example of something that's on the table, something that for many years at least the last 10 or 15 years, people have been talking about splitting this kingdom into various smaller kingdoms uh, based on genetic evidence. Because a lot of the things within the protist kingdom are not related to each other very closely at all. Um, so so putting them in the same kingdom is kind of, doesn't really make sense. So that's been discussed for a long time. So I'm, I'm not sure that maybe we're right on the precipice of splitting this group into at least three smaller groups. Um, but anyway, it's been on the table for a while. This It's a very diverse group and genetically it's also very diverse. So it probably doesn't belong in a single kingdom based on phylogenetic evidence, but here we are. Anyway, some of them are parasites. 
So they live inside of other organisms or on other organisms to get their energy. Uh, there's lots of things like kelp. I mentioned seaweed already. Kelp uh, is photosynthetic, um, which can be you know tens of meters long. You can have this huge, long, what looks like a plant, um, but is actually a protist. And normally in this unit, what we would do is we would go in the lab and we would look at three protists under the microscope. Uh, do I have pictures of them? Yes, I do. We would be looking at these three right here. So there is the paramecium, which is right here. There is the euglena, which is right here. And there is the um, amoeba right here. Okay, it's a specific species of amoeba. Um, I tried actually to order these at my house because <laughs> I thought, oh, I got a microscope. I have a microscope here, and I even I even borrowed the um, the video camera. We have like a microscope USB video camera that I could hook up, hook up on the laptop here. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll just do this at, at home, and that, but they they won't deliver protists to my house. That's kind of a bummer. I, I wonder why. I did, um, they said they only deliver to schools. Like, huh? All right. Well, I'm not supposed to go to the school right now, so. Um, I guess I guess I could go to the school just to pick them up. Hmm. The the problem is the timelines of it. It's pretty tight, so they only survive for a few days. So I, I I'm wondering if I I gotta time it just right. I I may be able to go. What's the temperature like outside? Ooh, it's a little on the cold side. It's three degrees right now here. Oh, sorry, I gotta sneeze, guys. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Allergies. Um, I, okay, here, here's, a, here's an idea. On a slightly warmer day, I don't think I'll be able to find any because it's too cold today, but on a slightly warmer day, I'm going to take a little field trip and pop back into the forest behind my house here. Uh, and there's, there's like a, a marsh. And I, I'm just going to grab some water out of the marsh and... Uh, I've got to have some glass slides somewhere. I, I wonder if I have some slides. Okay, an, an idea is forming here. I'm going to order some. I'm going to order some slides. I bet you I can get like a one-day Amazon delivery of slides. Let me let me do that during the break. I'm going to order some microscope slides. Uh, and I'm going to see if we can find some pond water organisms. They're almost all protists that live in the pond. All, all of the single-celled stuff is. Um... And then maybe we can just see what we can identify in some pond water together. Um, and th and th that'll be fun. That'll be fun. I bet you I can order some slow juice off of, uh, off of Amazon as well. So the slow juice is, uh, it has a technical name. I don't know what it is. But it, it, it's essentially an anesthetic for protists. So you, sl you can slow them down a bit. It makes it easier for you to be able to see them under the microscope. Um, let, let me investigate that. I, I'm going to look into that during the break, and uh, and then maybe we can take a look at some of these live together um, under the microscope. But anyway, uh, I, I, don't, I can't get these specific species. These might be in there, but um, it, it's a little bit easier if, if everything is the same species in your sample. It's easier to pick something out. Oh, yeah, methyl cellulose. That's right. <laughs> Did you use that in another class? You're right. That's what it is. Did you use it in grade ten? Maybe. It's not. We don't usually do this lab in grade ten, but some, sometimes we do. Oh, oh, I actually. Oh, I, I wrote it down here. Sorry, no, I'm being silly. I'm not even reading my own notes here. Yeah, there it is. Methyl cellulose. That's the slow juice. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll see if I can find this tomorrow. Um. So. Uh, anyway, lots of variety. There are some basic groupings here. These are the phyla. Uh, remember, that's like the next level down after kingdom. The phylums of protists. And they include, include things like euglenoids, which is what we would look at in the lab, which are mostly autotrophic. Some of them have the ability to take in nutrients from their environment as well. Um, so they have, I don't know if I'd call it a mouth. Remember, they're si single-celled here. Uh, but they have like a port for bringing in nutrients stuff 
uh, substrate. Um, but they're also photosynthetic, so uh, they, they gain most of their energy from photosynthesis. But they're really cool because they have flagella and they move around. So you don't really think of photosynthesizers as being these things that can like just like swim around, but they but they swim around mostly towards light. That's that's how they do their photosynthesis. So they swim towards lighter areas to try and photosynthesize. Um, there are a number of ciliates. Ciliates have cilia on the outside of their body, like this. Um, Ooh, why is the name escaping me here? This ciliate is called a... Oh, come on. I'm a, did I write it down on another page? Yes, I did. Paramecium. There we go. So paramecium is a ciliate. They have these little hairs on the outside, uh, and they kind of use them sort of like, um, like paddles. Uh, that you would use like if this was like a rowboat. They kind of like use them like little paddles and they can actually get them going quite fast and they, these guys zip around in the water. Uh, these, these ones are heterotrophs though so they um, they eat other protists mostly but they eat bacteria and things like that, other um, single-celled organisms. Um, then we've got some apocomplexa you don't need to know these various groupings, by the way. What what I do ask you to have a general knowledge of are the three that we normally investigate in class. I'm going to get you to do a little bit of research on the three that we normally investigate in class, but you don't need to know all of these, like in general. Okay, I'm, I'm just I'm just pointing out like, where some of the diversity lies here. So, um, apocomplexa are also unicellular; they're heterotrophic, um, and they are animal parasites, all of them. So that's one of their defining characteristics is that they're parasites. Uh, these ones you don't want to get into your gut or into your body in any way um, because they almost all of them cause illness in humans. Uh, diatoms are photosynthetic, autotrophs. Uh, these ones are really cool too. They glide around. Um, they create these like glass-like shells on the outside made of silica. They're very, very common in aquatic ecosystems, in the ocean and things like that. They make up a bot the bottom of a, a number of food chains in the ocean. Um, and if you've ever used something like chalk, I'm sure you've used chalk before, chalk is actually made out of ancient diatoms. So their shells, their glass-like silica shells, uh, get left over, they get compressed. Um, and they get turned into chalk. So if you've ever looked at chalk under an electron microscope, which you probably have not. Electron micrograph. There it is. So this is chalk under an electron microscope. And you might be looking at that and saying, what the heck? That's what chalk looks like? Yeah. Yeah. It's a bunch of the silica shells from diatoms that have been, they're ancient diatoms that have been compressed. Uh, so they used to be under a body of water. Um, and then now that location is now under land somewhere, ancient ocean. Um, and it's been compressed into chalk. That's kind of cool. I definitely didn't think that that's what chalk looked like. I didn't know what chalk was, but um, it's made out of diatoms. So ancient protists. Uh, amoebas have this pseudopod mo movement. There's an amoeba right there um, where they can kind of push their body into a pod. And then it's the weirdest process to watch. It like creates a, it like throws out a little leg and then it like pushes its body into the leg. So then it just kind of go, then it like goes here. And then it pushes its leg out again, and then it worms its way into into the leg. So, I'm, that's called pseudopod movement. Uh, although there are some uh, amoebas, I think that have a different type of locomotion, but it's primarily with pseudopods. Um, I've never seen an example of one that has a hard outer skeleton. I've only ever seen the the jelly-like ones that are like very flexible. So there uh, apparently there are. Um, ones with like a skeleton on the outside, a harder side, like a outer skeleton. I've never seen them though, so 
Uh, that's kind of cool. Uh, we're going to talk about slime molds a little bit more in a minute. Uh, that's the next little grouping here. These ones are, in my opinion, the coolest protists. Uh, and we'll talk about their life cycle when we get to that a little bit later. But they have a part of their life cycle where they're unicellular. And then later in their life cycle, all the unicellular organisms just get together. It's, it's fascinating. And then they act exactly like a multicellular organism at the end, working together. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a second when we talk about um, fungi-like protists. But anyway, I find that fascinating. So there's a, there's a lot of um, conjecture that... Okay, thanks, Cal. There's a lot of conjecture that um, slime molds and... Uh, other fungi like protists are the precursor of all multicellular life because that is they're living right on the edge of the difference between a single celled organism and a multi celled organism. Um, and so the thought is that the original multi celled organism is very much like a slime mold, but then it like lost its single cell stage and became permanently multi-cell. So I, anyway, I'm going to talk about that in a sec, but they have flagella or pseudopods as well. I'm going to show you how their locomotion works. Uh, and lastly, red algae. These are the things that you that look like plants. When you, when you look at red algae, it is long chains of green or sometimes red material, kelp, um, seaweed, basically, is what red algae is. And so you, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of different kinds, but they... They all look fairly similar, um, and you, you'd recognize it as seaweed. So uh, anyway, lots of different variety there. I, in fact, this doesn't even um, this doesn't even uh, really get into the actual amount of variety because how they actually look and live in colonies and things like that within these different phylums is actually like crazy so some of them you'd be like how are these two things in the same phylum they seem completely different from each other um they have some common characteristics but again they, they I, I i honestly can't explain it very well just uh, just in going through it here with a note so if you're really interested in protists um you can spend a lifetime examining these they're so cool uh amoebas are real slow movers that that uh, that pseudopod movement is not fast so that's it's that's its drawback. Now, that is kind of like a drawback, but it's also a benefit uh, in that they're really good at sneaking up on things. They're all heterotrophs, um, and so oftentimes they can kind of pseudopod around another protist, uh, which is what they do. They basically envelop them, uh, and then they kind of take the protist in and pump digestive enzymes into the pocket where they put the protist or whatever they're eating their food substrate but because they move so slowly sometimes they can kind of fully or half envelop something before that other organism even knows that there's something there it's just like a very slow encroachment around it and they just kind of don't notice um so that that's kind of part of its hunting strategy they're really slow though so when you look at these in the microscope unless you're like looking closely at them they, they don't really even look like they are moving they are uh whereas these guys uh ciliates and uh flagellates they, there's they zip uh, if you under the microscope, if you don't put slow juice on these methyl cellulose, they, they will they go across the viewfinder so quickly that it's just like a little whoo, <laughs> just like a little green thing zipping by, uh, and you, you you can't really even see them very well. So anyway, these these are very fast. These are very slow. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do here is talk about the three main types of protists. I realize that these are not phylums. But you can split the phylums into three main groupings. These are not official taxonomic structures, but within the study of protists, everybody uses this terminology to subdivide the types of protists. Okay, so there are three main subdivisions. I don't know. I don't think I, I actually put a an empty page here. I meant to put a blank page. Is it, I don't think there's a blank page in your notes. Sorry if there isn't. Um, you could add a page at the very end. In Kami, if you go to the last page and hit the Add Page button, you, you can add another page. But I don't think you can add one in the middle for some silly reason. They should really add that functionality. I, sh I should mention that to Kami. 
Um, you could also just do this on a piece of paper. Also fine. If you don't have a piece of paper with you, you could just add this to a Google Doc. On honestly, it really doesn't matter how you add it. But um, we're going to go through these three groups one at a time. So, like I said, there are three. I have a table here. The plant-like protists are the ones that you would look at and say, that's a plant. <laughs> okay? So that includes um, algae and other things like seaweed, as I mentioned, which is a type of kelp. Um, but really, um, the, their properties include that they are not motile. So now, you have to be very careful with these because I'm going to use words like usually. <laughs> Watch out for that. <laughs> because, again, protists are so diverse that it's not a all-inclusive statement to say that they're not motile. I mentioned earlier that there are some photosynthetic protists. They do photosynthesis, but they move around. Diatoms and... Uh, Oh, what's the other main group? Um, diatoms and euglenoids. Diatoms and euglenoids both move around and do photosynthesis. So they are considered to be plant-like because they're photosynthetic. But they are not fixed in place. So that's they're one of the exceptions to the usually not motile. Not motile um, means that they are stuck in one place. Another word of saying not motile or stationary is saying that they are sessile. Okay, so sessile means is the opposite of motile, not able to move. And when I say move, I mean move from place to place, not move in position. They are all autotrophs. which means that they do photosynthesis, and that is primarily how they get their energy. Some of them have ways of taking in substrate as well that are secondary, uh, but they all primarily get their energy from photosynthesis. What a weird group. So along with cyanobacteria, which is bacteria, by the way, a prokaryote, uh, but along with them, these plant-like protists make up the bottom of every single aquatic food web. So they are, I think, arguably one of the most important living things on Earth. They, they make up, and most species live in aquatic environments on Earth. We don't like to think of it like that because we don't spend our, the majority of our time in the water, but certainly the most diversity on Earth exists in aquatic environments. And the entire base of the food web aquatically is primarily these plant-like protists and cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is just a type of bacteria that does photosynthesis. So what are some examples of these? You got your green algae that's growing on the side of your aquarium. You got your brown algae, which is seaweed. Uh, and you got your euglenoids. There's also, oh, and diatoms. Actually, I should add diatoms there, too. Diatoms are a really important one, too. So those are the plant-like protists. The most important characteristic is that they do photosynthesis. Then, my little middle group here, is the animal-like protists. These are also called protozoans. Zoa means animal-like. So protozoans means animal-like protists. The same, same word. Same word where we get like the word zoo from, zoa, zoa, animals. So how do you know you're looking at an animal-like protist? Well, every single one of them is motile. So they, they all move around and they're all heterotrophs. 
So if they're zipping about and they're eating stuff, you can be pretty sure that you're looking at a protozoan. If that thing zipping about is green, it's likely that you're actually looking at a plant like protist that can move. <laughs> but if it's not green, chances are it's probably a protozoan. And the green comes from the um, parts of the light spectrum that they absorb in order to do photosynthesis. They, they absorb a similar spectra to plants, which means they reflect green light primarily. And so what are some ones that are zipping around? Uh, amoeba, stentor, paramecium. I could go on and on. That's just three examples, but there, there's many of them. Uh, in the pond water, if I'm able to get a good sample of pond water and find a bunch of stuff in it tomorrow, hopefully it'll be a little bit warmer, um, there will probably be, I would guess, 50 species in it minimum. Uh, and so we, we actually might have a lot of difficulty picking stuff out. I'm, I'm not quite sure. But there'll be a lot. It, it might be too much of a mess to even see. I don't know. I'll, I'll do my best. I don't know if all the stuff will arrive by tomorrow either. I might have to do it the next day. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order some stuff during the break, as I mentioned. Okay, and then lastly, we've got, in my opinion, the real weird one. These are the fungi-like protists. So, um... A lot of fungi-like protists are called slime molds. And these are protists that look like fungus. Uh, they look like mold. So, I mean, no surprise there. They, they're called fungi-like protists, so they do act like fungi. They're heterotrophs, so they eat stuff. But they eat stuff in a very similar way to how fungi eat stuff, which is that they exude digestive enzymes, uh, which digests the food externally, and then they absorb the broken down nutrients. So it's very similar to the way fungus operates. Uh, and then you got this weird way that they operate, which is that they, they start their life as a single-celled diploid organism. By diploid, I mean has the full set of genes of a normal adult and they just live their life as an individual cell going around getting energy and then once once they detect a enough of their kind around them and this 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 sensing is a lot like the quorum sensing in bacteria if you watch that quorum sensing video uh on the prokaryote day um that was the ted talk it's it's a very similar um, communication feature that these um, fungi-like protists have. They send out a signal, and then they get together into what's called a super colony. So they they move together. They're able to locomote, move, and they they primarily live in wet environments. They don't have to live in water. But they do need to live in a wet environment. All protists do. So that's one of their restrictions is they, they really are aquatic or they live in very wet environments. Um, but they, the, the individuals come together and form a colony, super colony. And then once they are together in that super colony, they are like permanently bound into a organism, one single organism where the cells all work together. They share all of their resources. They're able to pass resources between them. Um, they move as one. And, and this this is really unique in nature. So like this is, we have, it was single celled, completely operating independently. And then later in their life cycle, they become a multi-cell organism basically um, with all this complex intercellular communication, um, which is really fascinating. So they, they're, they're both kind of, um, and so a cool example of this is called dog vomit slime mold. That's its common name, obviously. Um, but it looks exactly like you think it looks. Uh, it looks like dog vomit. So um, they also have this really, really cool type of locomotion where they send out these little tendrils uh, 
to look for food substrate. And then if once a, one of the tendrils hits some food, something with nutritional value, they, they will pump the body of the fungus. And th- this is multiple cells. So they're, they're moving cells through the tendril into the new location at the end of the tendril. They like pump the body of the fungus through the tendril. And as it does this, it does it in like waves of pulses. It's like just like pulsing on the ground. I have a video of it. Um, I'll actually show you where the video is in case anybody's interested in this because it's it really is truly fascinating. Uh, I put it at the beginning of day four at the top. Uh, there it is right there. It's called mold time lapse. It's, this isn't an actual mold, by the way. It's a, it's a slime mold. Those are different. Um, and it shows how this movement actually works. If you're interested in watching it, like this pulsating body of slime mold, like pulsing across the ground, I highly recommend this. It is fascinating. Um, I also, I added actually a bunch of cool videos here. So there's a, there's another one here. I mentioned how the amoeba eat things that they like envelop them with their bodies and then absorb them. This is an amoeba attempting to eat another type of, uh, pond water organism called a stentor. And, uh, and you can see how it pseudopods around it. The, the thing on the outside there, that's like forming an arc, uh, on the top, that's the amoeba. And the stentor is the poor guy in the middle there. There's actually a paramecium in the bottom corner here as well, but I think that guy zips the heck out of there. Uh, paramecium are pretty pretty fast moving, so they don't I don't think they get caught up by amoeba too often. But um, anyway, so there's some cool there's some cool extra videos there on the day four page if you're interested. Although we're 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 lo- right now we're looking at the content at the bottom of day three. Okay, so that's the basics. <laughs> I, I I mean honestly we could do a whole course on protists. They're so complex and 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 odd, but I I'm just gonna leave it there. That's that's the that's an overarching sort of view of protists. Lots of different variety there. This is a little picture from the lab, but um, so what I'm gonna get you to do then is you should have this page. Um, what you're gonna do is uh, this is this is when we get to like the sort of work on your own stage. Uh, I'm gonna get you to find a, a picture. It can be any picture of an amoeba, a euglena, and a paramecium. These would be the three that we would normally look at in the lab. And then doing some quick internet research, I just want you to give me what the key characteristics are of each of these three organisms, okay? How do you know you're looking at an amoeba? How do you know you're looking at a euglena? How do you know you're looking at a paramecium, okay? Uh, You don't need to label the the diagrams or anything. Uh, We used to draw them in the lab when we did this as a lab. Uh, We actually used to do a lot of biological drawing, but too hard to do on a computer, so we kind of nixed it. Um, but I'm just going to get you to find a picture of each. These are easy to find. So um, find a picture of each, and then just the key characteristics of each, both behaviorally and structurally. Okay? All right. If you're looking for hints, if you're really stuck, um, I, I like I always upload these notes anyway. I have my version up there. You can look at what I've got. But I would like you to do a quick little examination of them first before you do that. That'd be ideal. Okay, last thing I'm going to get to here before I send you on your way is I'm going to talk briefly about fungus. Um, I don't dig too deep into fungus, so I'm going to keep this fairly basic. We're going to look at the sort of basic properties of fungus. And sure, you can just sketch it. I mean, Owen, these are not the most complicated organisms you've ever seen. (laughs) So you absolutely can sketch it. When we did this in class, we sketched it. So... Um, again, it doesn't have to be a super detailed drawing, but, uh, even if you look up a sketch of one of these, you'll see what they include in the sketches. It's always the same thing. So for like, for the, um, paramecium here, there's always cilia drawn around the, you can just see, you can actually see the cilia. If you look really closely, the little hairs on the outside, I highlighted them here with my, in red, but they have the little cilia, they have some organelles that you can sort of see on the inside. They have a mouth like opening at the front that they use to eat things. Um, like as long as you've got like sort of the key features, um, you should be good. And there's some questions that go along with that. It, this is, this is mentioned on Brightspace as well. Okay. For, so for fungus, how do you know you're looking at a fungus? Well, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to discuss fungus, uh, as a comparison to plants because plants, I think are what you're probably more familiar with. So first of all, you know, you're looking at a fungus, um, 
Nor- by the way, normally I get you to read this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna short shortcut this. You don't you don't need to read this. This I, I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna discuss it, and then we'll get it done faster. Um, fungus, fungi, or heterotrophs. So unlike plants, which are autotrophic, okay, this is, I'm just doing this as a comparison between the two here. So you you already know that plants are photosynthesizers, but fungi are not. Little bit smaller. Why is it doing that? Okay, there we go. So, fungi are heterotrophs. Plants are autotrophs. That's a, that's a major difference between them. Go through these one at a time. So we've got heterotrophic and autotrophic for plants. Um, Fungi have cell walls, but the actual molecule that the cell wall is made out of is different than what it's made out of in plants. So the cell wall in a fungus is made of a molecule called chitin. Um, you can actually um, t- taste, not taste, you, 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 the texture of the two is different. Um, you guys have had a mushroom before, right? Have you eaten a mushroom? Um, when you eat a mushroom, a raw mushroom, it has sort of like a rubbery chew to it. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? That rubbery texture is actually is is actually what you are perceiving, uh, because when you when you chew some plant matter, you get sort of like a crunch to it. Uh, and, there, and there's actually two reasons for that. For the plant one, it's because of the uh, there's a large vacuole in the center of plant cells that actually push the inside of the cell up against the cell wall. Uh, and that's called turgor pressure, and it it, it makes the cells ha- be like um, almost like balloons, like water balloons. So when when you when you put pressure on the outside and break the cells, you get like a crunch. Okay, that that that's a that's like the texture of eating cells and the, the the cell walls are made out of cellulose whereas when you're eating a mushroom there's sort of like a spongy feel to it it's a lot less crunchy so they don't have that central vacuole that makes like this crispy water balloon edge that pops uh and and, and the actual protein that the cell wall is made of what's well, not a protein but yeah actually yeah chitin's a protein sure it is um it has a little bit of a different texture okay so that, that that is common to all fungi. All fungi have that chitin cell wall, and all plants have a cellulose cell wall. So there, there's a large distinguishing um, thing between them. Fungi all reproduce through a process called uh, sporing or sporulation. They produce spores. Uh, we're going to talk about how that works in a second. Um, it's weird. So it it doesn't look the same as plant reproduction. Um, which uses a type of reproduction called alternation of generations. I, I mentioned that just briefly previously. But alternation of generations, um, the traditional one would be an adult plant produces gametes. That would be like a pollen or an egg. We're going to talk about this in more detail in the plants unit, by the way. Uh, And both of those things, those gametes, are haploid. They only have half of the full complement of genetic information. Um, But there's a male version and a female version. So the female version is some type of egg, and the male version is some type of pollen. Depends on the type of plant. Not not all of them are pollen, but a male and female version, okay? Uh, Those male and female versions have to come together somehow. So different plants have different ways of getting them together. Some have pollinators that move the pollen around, some use wind. Um, Some of them drop their uh, gametes into water and then water will bring them together. They will find each other in the water column, etc. But eventually those gametes are going to get together uh, and fertilize and form another diploid organism. So one with the full genetic complement of information again. Uh, And so once you have that, that's going to, that's a seed essentially. Uh, and then the seed will, will germinate and produce another adult plant. Okay, that's, that, that process is called alternation of generations. We'll get into more detail when we talk about plants. 
but fungi have a different system where they release spores. There's no male and female spores uh, because the spores are pretty much physiologically identical to each other. Um, but they do have a system of differentiation between, I don't want to call it male and female, they call it plus and minus in fungi. So there are plus spores and there are minus spores. And when a plus spore meets a minus spore, then they form a diploid organism that has both the full complement of genetic information. But they don't merge the two nuclei together. They keep them separate and the cells are multinucleated. Unlike in plants where they actually do take the pollen's nucleus and the egg's nucleus and merge them together to make one adult nucleus, that's diploid. So anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a different reproductive strategy. They, they're clearly different from each other. Um, so plants and fungus are not related very closely at all. Um, and I, I, I'm harping on this one point, this idea that plants and fungi are different because for most of natu- for, for most of the history of taxonomy, we actually put these together under the same group. We just called them both plants. Um, so like 150 years ago, uh, plants and, and fungi were just the same. That was the same group. Um, which is really weird, but <laughs> a, little, a little bit later, uh, a little bit more recently, um, a number of science scientists were like, well, th- these things are completely different from each other. They don't have the same reproductive strategy. They don't have the same um, ability to um, photosynthesize. They are biochemically very different from each other. And so then we separated them into separate um, kingdoms. So... Um, fungi, they, um, they can potentially use mitochondria and oxidative metabolism, uh, to make energy, to make ATP. Okay. So a lot of them do that, uh, but not all of them. So some of them use, uh, anaerobic respiration. Um, those are the uh, fungi that use uh, what's that process called? <laughs> Fermentation to uh, produce energy molecules, uh, and those an example of that would be yeast, which we we use that process to make alcohol. Um, but anyway, they they often use mitochondria though and oxidative metabolism, uh, whereas all plants use straight oxidative metabolism to produce their ATP. So there's no like there's no plants that use fermentation or anything like that. They don't have an alternative pathway to produce energy, an anoxic pathway. Okay, so some big differences between them there, obviously. Um, let's talk about their. Hold on, I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna. I think there's. I'm gonna. Normally, I don't uh, use my main ideas section at the top here during the lesson, but I think I've. I think I forgot to include some of this stuff, so I'm gonna I'm gonna mention it quick here. Um, here that this is we're gonna have to be careful here because I use the word most again. Um, so remember that when I say most, it means not all, which is a little bit confusing, because if I say most are multicellular heterotrophs, that is most of them have more than one cell and are heterotrophic; they eat things. They are all heterotrophs. Every fungus is a heterotroph, but they're not all multicellular. So yeast is an example of a phylum of fungi that is not multicellular. Yeast are unicellular. If you've ever used yeast to um, make bread or I don't know if you like make your own wine or something like that. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what people do at home, but bread maybe. Maybe you use it to make bread. Um, you would notice that they, they come in like little balls. You can buy yeast. It comes in like these little kernels. The kernels are actually compressed yeast. They're single-celled organisms. So like a bunch of yeast will get compressed into one of those little balls. But it, th- that ball contains, you know, hundreds of thousands of yeast, single-celled yeast organisms. And and they they can absolutely die. So they, they have like a lifespan in your fridge. If you, if you don't use them within a reasonable amount of time, they die. Uh, because yeah, just like all living things, you can't just like keep them in stasis forever. So, um, 
but they're single cell. They all have a process though of external digestion. That is, they emit some type of digestive enzyme uh, and then break down stuff in their environment and then take up the product of that digestion uh, and use it for their metabolism. Okay, so that's, that's, their, that's the typical operation of a fungus. Uh, we're gonna talk about their structure in a second, but it's made of something called hyphae, which are strands of fungus basically that make a web. Uh, they can reproduce sexually and asexually. We're gonna talk about that in more detail in a second as well. Uh, but their roles, what do fungi do in nature? Um, well, they have a lot of really important roles. I, I think fungi, fungi get short shrift. Uh, we often think of the, them as like mold, just like, oh, gross. I don't want mold on this. Or like, I don't want fungus growing in my house. Yeah, you probably don't want it growing in your house. That's, that's true. Uh, but they have a symbiotic relationship um, with plants, uh, which provides plants with a whole bunch of different types of nutrients, nitrogen compounds, um, often they allow plants to communicate with other plants via a network of fungi that grows in a subterranean web. Um, they are extremely important decomposers. I mean, you, you know that they're decomposers, but they are the primary decomposers of cellulose in the natural environment. So leaf litter, um, you know, wood, basically, plant matter. Uh, without fungi, that would just build up in the natural environment. There'd be like no natural cycling of cellulose. It's mostly broken down by fungi. So, uh, I mean, bacteria play a role as well, but fungi actually play a absolutely huge role uh, in breaking down plant matter. So they are uh, extremely important as decomposers, cycling nutrients through decomposition mostly. Um, they're also really valuable economically. They are a food source for people uh, and for animals. Um, we use them in the production of bread, as I mentioned. Uh, typically, yeast is used to make virtually every type of bread that you're aware of. Uh, you can make yeast-free bread, but it's flat bread. It's not typically what you would buy in the grocery store. Um, we use it to make certain types of cheeses. Uh, every alcoholic beverage is made with some type of fungus. Um, and they're also important as pathogens. So they cause human disease, uh, and they are harmful to crops, potentially. I mean, there are also fungi that are essential to the growth of crops. So it's it's sort of like a give and take. Some some fungi are pathogenic to various crops. I mentioned the poor Gros Michel banana, uh, which was destroyed due to a fungal infection. So that happens. But they also are maintaining uh, a whole bunch of different conditions in the soil for plants. Um, there are lots of symbiotic fungi that provide a bunch of different uh nutrient rolls for plants. So it's a give and take. So let's look at the actual body of this stuff. Uh, where do I start down here? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll zoom in right here. The most important thing for you to know is that when you look at a fungus and you see a mushroom, okay, that's this part right here. Whoopsie, whoa, what the heck? What just happened? Oh, guys, my iPad's losing it. What's happening? Oh, it's so mad at me right now. That was weird. Okay, this part, <laughs> there we go. I'm not really sure what happened there. Um, the mushroom is only the sexual organ of the fungus. So I think when people think about fungus, they think mushroom, uh, but the mushroom really is not the body of the fungus. That is just the sexual organ of the fungus. It's sort of like the flower of the fungus, which is the sexual organ for flowering plants. Um, if you see a mushroom, you can be absolutely certain that underneath that mushroom, there is a huge um, network of 
fungal tendrils. And those tendrils, by the way, are called hyphae. I think I write that somewhere here. Yeah, I wrote it right over here. Hyphae. Uh, and that mesh that the hyphae form, so it's like a whole bunch of different tendrils that make like a spider web that goes through the substrate that they live on. That, that spider web of substrate is called the mycelium. So the mycelium is the true body of the fungus. And it's usually much larger than the, the than the mushroom. So something to consider. If you see like a bracket fungus growing on a tree, there is a giant mycelium growing in the tree or through the body of the tree that is supporting that bracket fungus, the, the mushroom part on the outside. So that mushroom is only used for reproduction. It's not the main body of the fungus. And I say that that is important because if you see fungus growing on something like cheese or bread or whatever, what you see is only the sexual organ. So like that colorful stuff that you see on the surface, those are often tiny mushrooms basically is what they are. They're tiny spores, spore producing stalks. Uh, they make up a very small proportion of the actual fungus. The actual fungus is growing deep into the, into the substrate below. So when you're cutting it off, if you are going to cut it off, uh, you might have to cut a little bit deeper than you think because the actual mycelium goes quite, quite a bit deeper than you might, might, might guess into the substrate. Now, it depends on how soft it is. If you got a hard cheese, like a uh, Parmesan or something like that, uh, it actually is quite difficult for the mycelium to grow into a Parmesan. So you, you, can, you can cut off the, I don't know, relatively small piece off the, off the top and you're probably going to get most of the mycelium. But if you've got a soft cheese, like a brie or something like that, you're in big trouble. <laughs> because what what's actually, where, where the mycelium is, is probably the whole cheese. <laughs> it's probably everywhere underneath the surface of your cheese. So just so, something to note, because that's a really soft substrate. And, and the fungi grow extremely well in a soft substrate. They go real deep. So... The harder the substance is that the fungi are growing on, the harder it is for the mycelium to kind of dig its way through. So you may have a fairly low penetration. But if it's a really soft thing that you have fungus growing on, you can be fairly confident that that mycelium is going pretty deep, pretty deep in there. You might not want to just scrape the top off and eat it because the chances are you're, you're going to eat probably mostly fungus <laughs> underneath that. Just as a heads up, that was something that I didn't know. Um until I watched um, several very informative YouTube videos about where the mycelium grows of a fungus, but it, it is mostly below. So if you look at closer at these fungi um, cells, you will notice that um, the mycelium is a continuous... The hyphae is a continuous structure. Okay, think of it, it's like one, you can't really find specific cell divisions that occur here. Um, although there are sort of regions of the mycelium. And imagine that the fungus itself doesn't have a circulatory system. So it doesn't have specialized cells for pumping nutrients from one end to the other. Or So in order for the mycelium cells which are buried in the substrate, to send nutrients to the other parts of the fungus, it kind of has to be like an open transfer where osmosis, uh, not osmosis, um, what's the other one? Uh, diffusion, where diffusion is playing a role in kind of forcing substrate to move about through the fungus. It does a little bit of pumping, but... Um, it's, it's, it's pretty much an open system. And I mentioned that it is multinucleated. And the nuclei that you find are of the two parents. They're, they're not merged together into a single nucleus. And as it grows, uh, you guys know how mitosis works. You did mitosis in grade 10. But you basically get mitotic divisions of these nuclei that form new nuclei uh, that just get pushed out to the outer reaches of the hyphae um, 
and then that forms new mycelium at the end. The cells just continuously grow. So there, like I said, there are sort of, I don't know if you'd call them cells, but they, they're sort of related to each other through pores. Um, but they're, they're kind of all attached to each other. So th I guess there are cells, but they're, um, they're attached and all kind of open to a flow. So, um, really, really interesting, unique, um, arrangement sort of inside of a fungus it's it's different quite different from plants when we talk about plants and the way that their cells are sort of associated with each other you'll you'll see that it's not not like this at all so um before i keep going here do you guys have any questions about fungus in general that that's that's sort of like the basics i'll pause here for a second I'm gonna give you guys a chance to work. So, okay, if anything pops up in the comments, I'm gonna I'm gonna circle circle back. I want to briefly talk about the reproductive strategy of these guys. So, you don't really have to memorize this, but I want you to get a general idea of how reproduction works, and and especially because later on we're gonna talk about plant reproduction in some detail, and I want you to be able to compare these two processes later. So, uh, if you can imagine. We already talked about the idea of the mushroom. So this mushroom is going to form spores, okay? And those spores are going to be haploid. Haploid means that they have a nucleus, but the nucleus only has half of the full amount of genetic information. Okay, that's what haploid means. And another way of indicating that something is haploid is that you say that it is 1N. Okay, N is like the genetic material, the amount of genetic information in an organism. So 1N is haploid, half of the genetic information. And 2N is what's known as diploid. And this is the full genetic information of an adult of whatever species. Do I know why they taste meaty? <laughs> Mom and I do not have an answer for that question. <laughs> uh, mushrooms, uh, fungi of all different types, they have a whole host of flavors. Um, there are maybe, I don't know, you might have like five or six varieties in, in your grocery store. And if you go a little bit further afield to like a European grocery or like an Asian grocery store, you can, you can get like other fungi that are not typically found here. Um, there is a absolutely massive range of textures, of flavors, of fungus, and and it, it, it's all based on the proteins that the fungus produces. So our, there's a whole host of different flavors. Um, I'm not sure which flavor you're you're referring to specifically, but it would it would be just it would be down to the proteins that each specific fungus produces. So if you have like a crimini mushroom or like a button mushroom, they they all produce slightly different ranges of proteins. And those proteins have uh, interact with different flavor receptors on your tongue, so they, they have different, they taste different. So um, I'm not sure if I can answer that question. That's, that's uh, it might be a little too vague, but it's, it's fascinating. If you if you had a specific species of mushroom, maybe I could investigate that in more detail. And it's also possibly it's not a known answer. Um, but anyway, it, it it comes down to the proteins that they produce. Um, so spores are produced okay um and each spore as i mentioned has a haploid nucleus haploid is a one n okay um and then those spores will germinate okay really weird uh so here we go we've got some spores and there are sort of two flavors of spores i don't want to call them sexes because they they're not they don't have different strategies for reproduction like sexes do uh, the male strategy for reproduction and the female strategy for reproduction are different uh, and we're going to talk about that in probably great detail in the plant unit but 
generally, if we call something the male strategy for reproduction, it's qual uh, quantity. You produce a lot of it, uh, a lot of gametes, uh, but they have relatively little effort. <laughs> That's the sperm or the pollen. Okay, uh, There's lots of them, but they don't contain a lot of stuff except just the genetic information. Whereas the female strategy is to make relatively few gametes, eggs usually, but I mean, the egg is a very general term, but egg-like structures, but they contain all of the cellular machinery to produce a zygote, a fertilized egg that will go on to make a new organism. Okay, so the female strategy is about quality. The male strategy is about quantity. Fungi don't have that. So they have spores and all the spores are basically the same but they do have biochemical differences between them where you would call one of them or we at least oh shoot why is it doing that shoot go away uh where you would call one of them plus and one of them minus that, that that's those are the that's the terminology we use okay so if you can imagine these plus spores and these minus spores land and they just grow they grow as haploid organisms that only have half of the normal amount of genetic information. So that is not a mature fungus. It is just a hyphae that, ha that is haploid. Okay? And what happens is, just basically due to chance, and, and because they grow towards each other using specific chemical messengers, you will um, find two of these fungi, a plus and a minus, will run into each other in the environment. Okay? And when they run into each other, they will merge. And their nuclei don't merge. Okay, so it's really weird. They have they keep the two nuclei, as you can see right here, and they form something called a dikaryotic cell. Uh, dikaryotic cell just means two nuclei per cell. It's not di. I mean, it is diploid. It's diploid in that you. Diploid just means the full complement of genetic information. It is diploid, uh, but but the but the nuclei stay separate. If this was a plant or a, or a human, um, those nuclei would merge together and form um, a diploid nucleus that has all the DNA in it for the organism. But these these ones keep them separate, and we end up with this sort of dikaryotic um, mycelium system growing. And then that eventually becomes a full mature fungus, uh, and then it will produce its own spores that are plus and minus and send them out. So it's a little bit different of a reproductive strategy from what you see with um, regular um, diploid eukaryotes. Okay, kind of a weird a weird way to go. So That's just what I've summarized over here. So I said when two hyphae come in contact, two of their cells fuse, forming a dikaryotic cell, which is diploid. Diploid just means it has the full complement of DNA, but the nuclei are separate in a dikaryotic cell. And then typically, the fungus will produce a new mushroom cap, which will repeat the process. Not all fungi produce mushrooms. Obviously, yeast don't do that. Um, they reproduce through binary division, very similar to the way that prokaryotes do it, actually. Um, it's basically just mitosis and they produce new members of their population. So it's uh, quite a bit different than um, what typically happens in fungus, which is this. Yeast is the black sheep of the fungus world. Ugh. Okay, so just just to mention here again, in case anybody's not able to get what they need here, uh, all of the completed notes are posted in the course notes folder, and they are there for you right now. So I'm actually going to get you to skip question three. This is for time. Normally, I get students to investigate how yeast is used to create alcoholic beverages and bread. It's a fascinating process of fermentation. Um, but it's more extracurricular. We'll call that a uh, an enrichment question. If you're interested in doing it, cool. If not, skip it. I wanted to talk very briefly here about some just interesting 
mushrooms. Again, this is also something that I normally give as a little assignment, but I, I've like compressed this stuff out due to the um, limited time that we have in this uh, environment due to the uh, um, the cohorting and the the all day one subject strategy. So um, anyway, three really interesting types of mushrooms. Normally I get you to research these, but uh, most deadly. Um, well, I found two species that I think are probably in contention with each other. The death cap, which is known as am Amanita, am Amanita, 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 Amanita phylloides. <laughs> there we go. Amanita phylloides. Um, unfortunately, they look a lot like edible mushrooms. Uh, they grow in Mexico. Um, so people sometimes mistake these for edible mushrooms. Uh, but they cause a great deal of pain, vomiting, often coma, and death. Uh, they're extremely strong diuretic agents, and they cause kidney and liver damage when you eat them. That's the one on the far right there. So unfortunately, it looks like very similar to an edible uh, species of mushroom that also grows in Mexico. So uh, know your mushrooms. <laughs> Don't just go out and start eating mushrooms. Um, interesting fact when settlers started to come to North America from Europe, um, mushroom gathering is, just, is fairly normal in a lot of places in Western Europe. Uh, I know that my grandparents, when they were kids, would go and collect mushrooms to eat. That was like a thing that you did. Uh, and so did lots of people. And so when people came here, um, they collected mushrooms here that look exactly like edible mushrooms in Europe. But uh, sad to say that a number of those species that look like edible species in Europe are actually poisonous North American species of mushroom. So that, that confusion caused uh, uh, a lot of problems. Uh, so it, it was, I don't think it was very uncommon for people to have serious problems eating North American mushrooms. They look similar, uh, but it can often be deadly versions here. Um, so definitely if you are going mushroom picking, you better know what you're picking. <laughs> As I, as I tell my son, like, if you see berries in the wild, uh, don't don't eat them unless you're 100% sure what they are. If you don't know it's a raspberry, don't eat it. <laughs> so same goes for mushrooms. Um, most of them will just make you very sick and won't necessarily be fatal, but uh, you don't want to risk kidney damage just be for, uh, for some wild mushrooms, I guess. Um, anyway, the destroying angel, which is the one in the middle there, is... Uh, what makes them dangerous? They produce a number of uh, neurotoxic proteins um, that disrupt communications between your neurons. Um, they have various mechanisms that they use. Um, what one of them is neurotoxicity. Um, some of them are very powerfully um, diuretic in that they increase the pressure in your kidneys um, causing kidney damage. Um, some of them, the breakdown products in your liver for some of these is, are highly toxic. Um, basically, they, they produce proteins that when digested um, either are going to mess with the biochemistry somewhere in your body. It's either going to be neurobiochemistry or um, some of them are... Um, I, mean, I mean, a good example would be um, psilocybin, Psilocybin is a um, is a chemical that messes with your neurotransmitted ability in your brain, uh, and it causes hallucinations. You, I mean, you guys have heard of shrooms before, I'm assuming. Um, and so that, that's a, a, psilocybin is the chemical primary that's primarily that's produced there. That um, it basically messes with signal transmission in your brain. <laughs> so there, there, it causes hallu hallucinations. Um, and various effects, various neuro, uh, neuro effects. Um, some of them cause uh, muscle cramping and things like that. Um, there's a whole host, but it's it, it, the the reason why mushrooms produce those compounds a lot of the time is a protective mechanism. It's so animals don't eat them. <laughs> it's it, it's the reason why you find, you know protective mechanisms in many species like why why are the berries of a lot of species poisonous 
uh, to a lot of animals. Uh, and the reason is they don't want you to eat them. <laughs> the plants don't want you to eat them. And so the, the, the plants that had the most, uh, the berries that were the most averse for animals eating them were the ones that ended up surviving and reproducing. It's just a, like an evolutionary process. And the same thing is true for fungi. Um, now, that's not to say that plants never want animals to eat their berries. They do. Uh, but they usually only want certain animals to eat them. And in the case of a lot of plants, I'll use plants as an example, um, they, they want birds to eat their berries because when a bird eats their berries, they normally don't digest the seeds. They just digest the berry component and they drop the seeds off in a little pile of fertilizer um, some distance away from the adult plant, which is a perfect strategy for distribution. That's uh, very helpful. However, if... Um, you get a large mammal eating your seeds. Oftentimes, it stays in the large mammal so long that it destroys the seeds uh, through digestive processes. Uh, and they also tend to deposit their seeds in giant clumps of seeds uh, and not necessarily in an area that is going to be beneficial to the plant. So, um, they, so, so they, then, you, then you find berries that tend to be poisonous for one particular species. Uh, often it's for us, we're mammals, large mammals, uh, whereas birds eat them no problem. So, uh, and they, they've also evolved their own strategies for dealing with the toxins that are found in those berries. So um, it's a game, it's a game. We're trying to, we've, we're evolving um, to be more resistant. By we, I mean animals, um, whereas plants are evolving to be more more toxic. It's sort of like a, a um, what do you call that? Um, an arms race between the two. We're going we're gonna to actually talk about that idea of the arms race in the evolution unit a little bit more. But sorry, that's I, I've kind of gone off track here, but um, that, that, that's what makes fungi dangerous. They produce a bunch of proteins um, that have breakdown products that are have various toxic effects, neurological, and uh, they disrupt muscle function, things like that. The last one I wanted to mention here is this idea of the European truffle, which I'm sure I've never tasted before. Um, they are 2200 euros or 3148 dollars a pound um which is extremely expensive um so i'm pretty sure that whenever i've eaten a chocolate truffle it was not actually a truffle uh because there's no way that i was paying anywhere close to that price uh, maybe i'll never have these uh maybe i will but uh <laughs> i think it's unlikely so anyway some cool examples of fungus uh, this last one, I actually do want you to do the research on. So in very brief, because I'm going to get you to look into this yourselves, uh, poor bats, poor North American bats uh, have been absolutely plagued by a fungal infection called white nose syndrome. And it has caused a decimation of the bat population, decimation meaning uh, a tenthing. Uh, they have 90% of North American bats um, have, have been essentially disappeared because of white nose syndrome. It's very, very significant ecologically. If you visit a uh, park in Canada or the U.S. where there's caves, uh, they usually have little stations set up for you to disinfect your clothing before you go in and out uh, to try and prevent the spread of white nose syndrome fungus um, from one cave to the next um, because it's so problematic for bats. Uh, and bats are extremely important. Um, they're keystone species in many ecosystems, um, and they are responsible for a great deal of uh, insect population regulation, which we really appreciate as humans. Um, anyway, I'm going to get you guys to investigate this white fungus a little bit. Um, and so I want, what I want you to find out is, what is the current status of white nose syndrome? I actually don't know the answer to this. So the last time I looked into this was last year. But what's the status? Are we controlling it? Is it still causing significant problems for North American populations? Is there a natural evolution of bats that is working? Um, is like is the, is the bat population recovering? Um, and, and then in general, I'd like you to investigate how has the change of bat populations influenced other species in, in their ecosystems. And this information is out there, like why are bats important and how has this change in bat populations been affecting um, the their ecosystems, okay, their interactions with other organisms. 
Okay, so there's sort of like a two-part question there. And you're just going to answer that right in the notes. And there are some questions that go along here. It's page 85, 1, 5, and 7. So I think I mentioned in on Brightspace to do question 3. That's this question right here. Uh, but you can skip it. Okay, I, we'll, we'll call that uh, enrichment activity, but you can definitely skip it. So, okay, what are we up to right now? Let me go through it all. There is a short video here, uh, Bozeman Science video, that is a summary of different types of protists. And this one's cool because it shows you some visual examples, some videos, some pictures of various different types of protists, things that I don't have. So watch that video. Then there is that table of three different protists. This won't take you too long, but I just want the basics. What is important about uh, euglena? Okay, maybe three or four points. Okay, what's structurally important? What is uh, behaviorally important? Like how, how do they operate? Okay, and then there are a couple questions that go along with it from the text. So that's what you're doing for protists. Um, there are these videos, again, they're enrichment videos that are at the top here. You don't have to watch these, but if you're interested in seeing more um, videos of protists in action, there's a an amoeba eating a stentor. You don't have to watch the whole thing. You get the idea after the first minute. Um, and then there's this really cool time lapse of slime mold moving around. If you're interested to see what its locomotion looks like, it is fascinating. So again, watch that whatever part you want. Watch five seconds of it. You'll get the idea. But if you're interested, um, you can see how that slime mold moves around. For fungus, there is a brief summary video here that's going to dis discuss the types of fungus and go over the structures again. That might be helpful because we, we went through it relatively quickly. Uh, I mentioned here complete question three and five, but you don't need to do three. Okay, so skip three, only question number five. Um, three is about the fermentation process and you don't really need to know that and it's not really in the curriculum. So that's be enrichment. Uh, and then there are a couple of analysis questions that go along with that. It's page 85, one, seven, one, five, and 7. And those are the ones that go in your questions document. Remember that the textbook questions go in your questions document and the um, notes, the stuff that goes in the notes, just stays in your notes. You don't need to put that in your questions document. Okay, and I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to stop talking. Um, I'm going to give you probably some time at the beginning of block two to work on these as well. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. If you guys have any questions at all, please let me know. Um, but that is protists and fungi. And I'll be back at 11.05. As usual, if you happen to come in late, just let me know in the chat. No problem. Okay, so uh, you guys haven't had an opportunity to um, work on the protist and fungi content. Uh, I realize that you have not had enough time to work on it, probably not to finish it, which is which is totally fine. Um, I, I think what I'm going to do uh, is go through the plant content, um, which is it's it's relatively brief. Um, let you know what you're going to work on at home. It's it, it's 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 not as much. There's a little bit less for plants, and that's intentional because we're going to spend a whole unit discussing plants. So I didn't go crazy overboard here with the uh, with the plant stuff. So um, once we're done the lesson together, there is a brief overview video that talks about the various types of plants. And uh, there is a little, a little summary table in your notes on page 16 on the different phylums of plants, uh, which we're going to ex expand on in great detail in the plants unit. So it, it's just really just basic stuff here. Uh, and then there's a couple questions from the text that go along with plants. So uh, I'm going to go through the note. I'm going to keep it, again, relatively brief just a brief overview of plants and we'll leave all like the real detailed meat and potatoes stuff about plants for the plants unit. Okay, so here is a phylogenetic tree of plants and you'll notice that the ancestors of plants, if you go back in the phyl phylogenetic tree, are probably um, common ancestors with green algae with protists uh, and that's for fairly obvious reasons um, they share a very specific molecule um, for doing photosynthesis which is 
Um, oh. oh, I hate it when I something like that just floats right out of my mind. Um, did I write it down here? That would have been helpful. Um, it's the photo pigment that plants share with protists, and it is called. Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Oh, come on. <laughs> I hate it when this happens. Um, oh, for goodness sakes, I'm going to have to Google this. this I hate that. It, it's on the tip of my tongue. We all have those days. Chlorophyll. <laughs> Oh, Lord. I don't know why that took so long. <laughs> it's a green pigment. Chlorophyll. Um, so there are green algae, at least, um, uses chlorophyll. There are other photopigments that exist, but most land plants also use chlorophyll. So anyway, this molecule exists. It's a specific molecule, and it's a shared um, thing between them. And so they likely have a the same evolutionary origin because they share this exact same molecule. So... Um, there is a another grouping here of um, protists called Cherophyceans, which um, I'm going to call them protoplants. So they don't have um, uh, they're water based, uh, and so they they are not fully land plants, and so they they still qualify as protists here under this model. Their reproductive strategy is not alternation of generations, uh, and their physical, physiological structure is a little bit different than plants. So, so those those Cherophyceans are sort of like the protist precursors to plants. They're they're similar to plants, um, but there are some key uh, structural differences. So the first true land plants um, that evolved were likely bryophytes. So um, bryophytes are uh, well, they're I mean they're fairly diverse grouping, but they include things like liverworts, hornworts, which you may not be familiar with. You're probably familiar with moss, I'm assuming, and, and a lot of um, bryophytes are mosses. So let me just show you what a moss looks like. They're these lovely organisms. So you've seen these on the forest floor probably before. Lovely mosses. So um, these are different from other land plants in that they have no vascularization. They're kind of similar to fungus in that they, they pass on water and nutrients just from cell to cell. Uh, they don't have tubes to transport nutrients around the plant. That's vascularization. Like, for example, we have a vascular system. Uh, animals generally have a vascular system that for transporting nutrients around. That's our circulatory system. So um, bryophytes don't have that. Which is why they don't grow very tall. They're they're relatively low lying because they don't have the ability to move water too far from the substrate that they grow on, and they also are required to live in moist environments generally, um, because they don't really have anywhere to store water either. So uh, they have to be in a fairly moist environment in order to maintain their structures. Okay, so um, they don't produce seeds. They produce sort of a spore reproduction me mechanism, but they have all the other features that you would normally expect in a plant. Um, they have, as I mentioned, chlorophyll, photopigment. They have um, cellulose cell walls. Um, they are land-based. Um, they store their... Um, they store their products of photosynthesis as starch. 
So all plants do that. Protists do not store their sugars as starch. They have a different uh, storage mechanism for their sugars that they produce from photosynthesis. So um, all land plants use starch. Uh, and then I also mentioned this, this idea of they have cellulose in their cell walls. Okay, so mosses are sort of like the most basic, earliest evolved land plant. Uh, from them, a slight modification to that is the pteridophytes. So pteridophytes include ferns, horsetails, whisk ferns. Um, these are all relatively closely related to each other. Okay, they're called pteridophytes. Um, and they have a basic form of vascularization. So that, that we can call that an upgrade, I guess. So you would call them a vascular plant. They live on land and they have a vascular system. So they can grow much higher off of the surface substrate because they can pump water through their vascular system. So that's the main difference between them and bryophytes. They still reproduce using spores. Uh, in fact, ferns have a really cool reproductive um, cycle where they drop male and female spores into the water. They need water to reproduce. And the spores are actually capable of swimming. I, I should find a video on YouTube of this so you can see it. But the spores like swim through the water. They're these little plant organisms. They look very strange. And then they meet up with males, meet up with females uh, in the water and form a uh, fertilized um, adult cell together. Uh, and then from that, they can attach to some substrate and begin growing a new fern. Ferns do require water, though, for reproduction because of the way that they have to drop their spores. So they only grow adjacent to running water or a location where there will be running water at some point in the season, for example, during flooding or during a, a large rainstorm or something like that. That's what triggers their reproduction because they drop their spores into water. So you're never going to see them on like a really dry area because they just they can't grow there. So, or they can't reproduce there. So that's that's pteridophytes. Um, the next iteration, evolutionarily, of plants um, are gymnosperms. So uh, they are the first real trees that you would see um, in geological history. So somewhere around 350 million years ago is when we started seeing the first trees. Uh, before that, you would you basically are just seeing ferns on land. Um, gymnosperms are, uh, you, you can tell them apart pretty easily uh, because they have cones. And their, um, their leaves are usually in the form of some type of needle-like structure. So when you see uh, a dinosaur movie, uh, anywhere from 350 million to when did... When did the last dinosaurs go extinct? 50 million years ago? Something like that. Um, whenever you see that, it's a huge time span, by the way. Um, you, you, know, you shouldn't really see any deciduous trees. You shouldn't see any trees with leaves uh, because they didn't exist. So, uh, again, you can sort of have a look at how accurate those... Um, I should, actually, I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. It actually it, it depends. Um, there are dinosaurs in the Mesozoic period, too which is between 250 and 50 million years ago. Uh, so they're, they're actually, so that's not entirely true. That, that, that's when we started seeing the very first um, flowering plants. So that's right around this time right here. Um, and, and actually, so that's, that's, not, that's not entirely accurate. The, the late dinosaurs um, would have been alive during this period. Uh, there's a huge time span in which there were dinosaurs and the types of dinosaurs that existed at the different periods in time are very different from one another. And they no normally just mash them all together in a dinosaur movie. So for example, Jurassic Park, they got stuff together, living together in Jurassic Park that were never alive together in an actual geological time. They, they just like took a, a 300 million year time period and just mushed all of the different <laughs> organisms together and said, wow, whatever, they're all dinosaurs. But they, they didn't live together um, at the same time in real life. But it, it doesn't really matter. The, um, the, uh, so uh, relatively recently, um, we, there was an additional split here um, into angiosperms. And angiosperms are now the most common type of plant on Earth. They make up 90-ish percent 
of all of the all of the plants on earth and what makes angiosperms special uh, is that they produce flowers so before angiosperms all we had it was cones really in terms of reproductive structures on trees uh, and then angiosperms added flowers so flower there are a whole bunch of reproductive advantages to flowers uh, which we're going to get into detail um, in the in the plants unit. So I'm not going to get into it now. But basically, the original plants were uh, something like mosses. They're low lying and have no vascularization. Since then, we've seen the development of pteridophytes, which have vascularization, so they can grow higher off the surface. But they still need to live near water for their reproduction. They don't have flowers or anything like that. Gymnosperms are really the, the next iteration, which is formed trees or tree-like organisms. Uh, not all gymnosperms are trees, but they they can be trees. Uh, and they have cones that they use for reproduction. They're still vascularized. And they do form seeds. But the seeds that gymnosperms make are called naked seeds, uh, and they're not very hardy. So they, they generally don't survive very well over extended time periods, which is one of the advantages of flowering plants, which is that they make um, enclosed seeds, and those enclosed seeds do fairly well, if, even if they're dried out or swallowed by an animal or whatever. Okay, so that would be the last iteration here, this idea of the flowering plant, which, again, has so many advantages that they've taken over as the dominant form of plants on Earth. Um, if you were to go back 200 million years ago, um, the only trees that you would see would be gymnosperms they were completely dominated the surface of the earth so uh, and in a very a relatively short time span uh, flowering plants have completely taken over all plants use uh, a reproduction method called alternation of generations which I mentioned um, when we were talking about fungus this is like the uh, in contrast to the way that fungal um, organisms reproduce um, what happens here is that an adult diploid, remember diploid means that you have the full set of chromosomes, the full set of genetic information, um, will produce a haploid organism. Sometimes they're called spores, um, which is known as the gametophyte generation. Uh, the sporophyte generation is the adult generation. So what happens is the adult generation produces uh, some type of spore. It could be pollen. Um, that The male usually produces pollen. This is a, a fern reproductive cycle here, but it, it's relatively the same for all plants. So you have a male, and then over here, this would be the female, um, which Again, differs depending on the type of plant, but it's like some type of egg structure. Um, these spores are going to go out into nature. They are one N. They only have half the genetic complement of an adult organism. They meet up through some strategy in nature. Okay, so we get the one N from two different plants here coming together. And again, this depends on the type of plant, how they come together. They could come together in water. Uh, an insect could transport the pollen to the egg. Uh, wind could transport the pollen to the egg. So again, it d depends specifically on the species and, and the type of plant. Uh, but they're going to come together and fertilize and produce a zygote, a 2N organism. Okay, that would then, then we go back to what's called the sporophyte generation. So a sporophyte has the full genetic complement. This would be a seed. The seed is going to germinate and produce an adult plant, which is again going to produce spores, the spores are known as the gametophyte generation. So it keeps alternating between 1N, half the genetic complement, and 2N, the full genetic complement. So it goes gametophyte, then sporophyte, then gametophyte, then sporophyte, then gametophyte, then sporophyte. So that, that's alternation of generations. It keeps alternating between these two um, generations. Okay, so that's... that's uh, that's the basics of plant reproduction. We're going to get into more detail during the plants unit, but that, that's what alternation of generations means. Okay, they keep alternating between having half the total complement of DNA to the full complement to half to the full. And then in whenever they're in the half 
stage, they need to meet up with another half from a different member of that species. That's sexual reproduction. Now, they also have various asexual reproduction methods. Um, for example, cuttings. Uh, plants can break off a piece of them, essentially, and grow a plant from that piece. Sometimes root separation on plants, just due to shifting of soil and things like that, can form a new plant structure. Uh, sometimes plants will bud off of the root, so you can grow the roots of a plant will grow down into the soil and then come back up in a different spot and form a new plant. Um, technically that plant is a clone of the original and depending on your definition of individual it may you could potentially think of it as the same individual because uh, they are attached but that is a form of asexual reproduction. So, um, so there's the basics. Okay, uh, That's really all that I need you to know about plants. What I'm going to get you to do is fill in this chart um, of the basic unique properties of these four. Okay, you get it from the textbook. It's page 89 to 94. Um, there's a little bit of review in there. So there's a, there's a little bit of reading for this chapter as well. Gives you a little bit of more information about the evolution of plants and the background on these four groupings. Okay, but these are the main phyla of plants. Bryophyte, pteridophyte, gymnosperm, and angiosperm. That, that terminology um, is relatively unimportant in this unit. Uh, you, you need to know the basics for each of those, um, like what makes them unique. Uh, however, in the plants unit, we're going to be getting into far more detail in each of these. So if the, these are words that you may want to store away, um, they're kind of important uh, because we're going to be doing a whole unit on them. And then there are a couple analysis questions from the text, questions number two and three. Okay, so that's the basics of plants. I'm not going to go into any more detail because we're going to do a whole unit on it. So to reiterate, hopefully at this point you are done the uh, protists content, um, which includes this video, question 13, or question on, the question on page 13, summary table 3. Uh, and the analysis questions from the text. Ho hopefully you've had a chance to complete those at this point. If not, it's okay. It's not a big deal if you're still doing the analysis questions. Um, you've got the um, fungi, fungi video. I think it's about six minutes long. Um, you don't need to do question three from the text, but question five you should do. And then there's three questions from the textbook. And then lastly, um, you, this is a great summary video that goes over the characteristics of the four groupings. This video has roughly the same information as the chapter from the text. So you could potentially substitute that plant chapter with what's in this video. It's going to go through the groupings, and you can use it to fill in the chart as well if you'd like. I think it's about 10 minutes long. It's 7 minutes long. 7 minutes long. So either way, I'd say you could do it either way. Uh, so that's the, that, that's the use to complete the summary table at the bottom of page 16. And then there are two questions from the text. OK, guys. Again, I'm going to give you an opportunity to work on this. Uh, I won't, I'll stop talking. Does anybody have any questions that they'd like me to discuss? I, I kept that fairly brief, which is what I, what I was intending before we leave. Oh, interesting piece of news, I, uh, which is very pertinent to what we were discussing yesterday. Um, the vaccine has been approved. Uh, I believe it's the Pfizer vaccine, although I have to double check, uh, has been approved for use um, in 12 plus, ages 12 plus, in KW. So if you are 12 years old or older, uh, you can now sign up on the region, uh, the region of Waterloo Public Health website uh, for an appointment to get vaccinated. So if that's something that you're interested in, and hopefully you are, um, you can sign up. Hooray! Approved for use in young people. Amazing. But that was in the news the other day, too, that they, it had been approved in the U.S. Cool. Already signed up. Awesome. I had the Pfizer one, too. Sore arm for one day. No big deal. I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. The, um, the, uh, the symptoms that you get from the vaccine are different for everybody. Um, but for the most part, the first shot is fairly innocuous. Uh, not, not a lot of people get significant symptoms from the first shot. The second shot is a little bit more rough. Sometimes people have flu symptoms for a day, um, and that's just that's your immune system um, essentially ramping up due to the uh, due to detecting the virus or 
antigens for the virus in your blood. Um, but I mean, it's not harmful. It's just uncomfortable for a day or two. So, so there's that. Right. Sorry, Bree. So yes, so, some people do have um, more symptoms from the first shot. My mom did too. My mom got the Pfizer shot and she, uh, she, she had like flu-like symptoms for a couple days after her first shot. So, so it, it does vary from person to person. Some people's immune systems have a stronger reaction. Now, on the plus side, um, at least you know it's working. <laughs> you are um, creating an immune response, which is what you're shooting for. So, yeah. So, sorry to hear that. So some people do have worse symptoms than others. I, I know it's really bad for my mom. My mom was not a happy camper. Uh, but again, it's not it's not harmful or dangerous to you. It's just uncomfortable. So, so there's that. Yeah, I don't want to mislead anyone. There are um, there are side effects, um, but they're just they don't tend to be that significant. Yeah, I had none, so which is the sore arm. My wife had no no symptoms either, so um, it's different for everybody. Okay, I don't see any. Sp- specific questions about this content so I'm going to let you get to work am I wrong oh hold up was I supposed to cover animals today ah geez no that's too much oops I forgot that I had that in there it's because the plant content is so short ah that's too much I'm gonna I'm gonna do that animal stuff um the learning block to animal stuff. I'm going to do that at the beginning of tomorrow. That's that's too much stuff for one day. No, otherwise, I'm clubbing you over the head with content here. We, we can't do that. Um, that'll still give us lots of time to work on the project tomorrow as well. So um, hopefully, um, as we've been going through these species, yeah, don't don't worry about the, uh, the animal stuff. We'll, we'll do that tomorrow. That's also relatively short. Um, Hopefully you found a species or at least a grouping of species that you're interested in as we've been going through these um, topics uh, for your project. And you can start your project at any time. So if you're interested, you know what it entails. So um, just so you know, that's also an option that's available too. If you're like, oh, I'm done everything. I, I'm looking for something to do. I don't know if people do that, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but you do get a full block tomorrow. It'll be the second block tomorrow. You'll have the entire block to work on your species spotlight assignments. It's like two hours. So just so you know. Okay. Don't see any questions. I'm going to let you get to work and stop talking. Good luck.